These are nachos, golden crispy chips, gooey melted cheese, mounds of toppings galore. They are delicious. They're named after a man, a man named Nacho. This was Ignacio Anaya, known to friends and foes alike as Nacho. In 1943, Ignacio was a maitre d' at this restaurant, the Old Victory Club in Piedras Negras, Mexico, a border town a jalapenos throw from Eagle Pass, Texas, home of Fort Duncan, an army base filled with military men and families. One day, a group of army wives crossed the border. They shopped. They got hungry. They went to the Victory Club. The chef wasn't there. But Ignacio, maitre d', didn't want to turn the women away, so he sprang into action, grabbing tortillas, shredded cheddar cheese, and jalapenos. He put his creation into the oven. Pensively, he served it to the army wives. They loved it. Returning to Texas, they spread the E. Evangelio del Nacho, the gospel of the nacho. Nachos Especialios became so adored and renowned, Ignacio opened up his own restaurant, the creatively named Nachos Restaurante. The creation of the potato chip is a rather snarky, surprising, and idiosyncratic story. When french fries made their way to America, they soon became a restaurant mainstay. Many restaurants served fries as their signature dish. Believe it or not, they were once considered very hoity-toity. In 1853, George Crumb was a chef at the Moon's Lake House in Saratoga Springs, New York. Their signature dish was none other than Moon's Fried Potatoes, or as the aristocrats would say, potatoes served in the French manner. One day, just like any other, a customer some believe to have been Cornelius Vanderbilt himself ordered fries. Upon being served, Cornelius scoffed and sent them back. He deemed the fries soggy and not crispy enough. This insanity continued a few more times, until Crumb lost it. I mean, he really lost it. He fired back, cutting the potatoes paper thin and frying them up. You see, back in 1853, eating with your hands was a major faux pas making Crumb's revenge even more diabolical. By cutting the potatoes paper thin, there would be no way that Cornelius could use his fork, forcing him to use his hands. Crumb's plan backfired, kind of, as the patrons dug in with both hands and loved them. Saratoga chips were born. They became a Saratoga dining staple. Soon thereafter, they took the world by storm. Crumb himself even opened his own restaurant with baskets of chips displayed on each and every table. There's more to sight than just being able to see the crowd. You can definitely feel the atmosphere. There's a vibe in the air, there's the energy in the air, there's the sound. It's amazing to, to hear the fans, especially when we run out of the tunnel. I'm Jake Olson. I'm the long snapper of the University of Southern California Trojans. I'm completely blind, I, I have no eyes. I went into playing football with the mentality that I had nothing to lose. Long snapping is an art. You definitely have the mechanics, but a lot of it's just feel, feeling that ball come off your fingertips in a spiral, how hard you're throwing it, you know, where you're releasing it, just kind of getting that velocity and, and, that, and the accuracy. Set, there we go. Life's unfair, football's unfair, but at the same time, it's up to you of how far you want to take yourself. When I was eight months old, I was diagnosed with a rare form of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. When the doctors found my cancer, it was completely taken over my left eye, so they almost immediately removed my left eye. From there on, you know, just a cycle of, you know, the cancer coming back, then we fight it with treatments. Doctors finally said, listen, we pretty much exhausted all, all treatment options. The safer option is just, you know, the removal of the eye. Growing up in the 2000s where Coach Carroll was 
so dominant with USC. It was hard not to be a USC fan. I always loved football. I continued to play flag football my eighth grade year after losing my sight. It was not anything close uh, to tackle football. As I entered high school, I decided not to play football for my freshman and sophomore year. It really was something that I didn't think I could do, but eventually my love for the game really overcame any doubts and, and I learned how to Set. be an asset. Set. There you go. Money. I just love the camaraderie of football. I love being part of the team, love putting on, you know, just the pads and the jersey and stuff and being part of the team was enough just to, to get me to try. How many people have the opportunity to be a world champion at anything? We have the opportunity to do something that no one else does. This isn't played anywhere else in the world. So yeah, like it's serious, like we want to win. We're here to watch unicycle football. It's football on unicycles. We stick the NFL rules as closely as possible. Except there are a few exceptions because we're riding a unicycle. We play five on five, two receivers, a blocker, a center, and a quarterback. Everything has to be done on a wheel. The second your foot touches the ground, you're done. Each team plays 14 games. There's 56 regular season games total, then wild card playoffs, then playoffs, and then the Super Bowl. Every Sunday, some people have been doing this for 10 years now. My team, the Black House, we're undefeated, and we're gonna be playing the reigning champs, the Herons. Bulldoze them over, bulldoze them. This game is very important because we want to maintain our undefeated status leading up to the Super Bowl. They're definitely gunning for us. They're practicing just for us. I think that a lot of times people come to this game, what shocks them is the level of play. We're crashing at 15 miles an hour. It's not a joke. Some people get seriously injured. Most people learn to ride unicycle because they came and witnessed this event and they're like, I've got to do this. Once you catch that first ball, once you get that first rush, once you hear the crowd scream your name once, that's a feeling you can't get anywhere else. That's almost like a religion church to us here. There's passion, you know? It's a show, it's a spectacle, it's also a sport. I've cherished every minute of it. It's, you can't replace it with anything. There's nothing else like it at all. <laughs> When you see the players get the ball in their hand for the first time, it's a cross between intrigue and excitement. It's great to see them try and bounce the ball and to see it actually bounce away. It can make the best of people look really, really silly. The number one sport in Australia is Australian rules football. It's basically a cross between rugby and soccer, and the fans go crazy for it. There's one problem. They don't have enough tall people. So what do they do? They come to the States. This combines the USAFL combine and uh, we started this four years ago. Basically in a search for, for guys six foot seven and above. And these tall American athletes, they don't really need to know a lot about Australia. The home of the kangaroos, I, I think. I know a lot of kangaroos. I hear a lot about kangaroos and spiders and snakes. Yeah, in selecting these athletes, we predominantly look for guys that are hungry. And most of the participants predominantly come from basketball. The concept of basketball in terms of the athlete being in traffic and having spatial awareness and those sorts of things is really transferable to our game. Which is good news because less than 2% of college basketball players will make it to the pros. The Australian Football League gives them another chance to live out their dreams of being a pro athlete. Most of the participants are quite shocked when they see the game for the first time. 
The question is, what do the athletes think of all this? When I got the combine invite, I thought it was fake, actually. I thought it was a scam. The first thing I thought, I thought it was a scam. I thought they was uh, contacting the wrong person, actually. What is Australian football? Skepticism aside, how do you teach these guys a game they never even heard of before? So the combine kicks off in the early piece with the physical testing and then start to build into the skills. The basics of handballing, the ability to see what they're like with their hands. Then we can start to get into the more competitive stuff where they might crash and bash into each other, which they love that. This is Mason Cox. He played basketball at Oklahoma State. Two years ago, he was just like one of these guys on the combine. Now, he's playing professionally in Australia. They can be one of the 22 superstars out there on an AFL team. It's a fantastic opportunity for these guys to continue their professional career. Okay squad, listen up. There's more than one way to end a game of sports ball. There's the walk-off home run, the sudden death goal, the buzzer beater. But within the adrenaline-addled psyche of the American sports fan, can any of them produce a heart attack like a successful Hail Mary pass? Don't answer that. It's rhetorical. Why are Hail Marys special? Because they're unicorns. Since 1975, there's only been 28 of them in professional football. Why? Because they're almost impossible to get right. To complete a Hail Mary, the pass needs to be long, like thrown from midfield long, with little or no time remaining on the clock. And you need to be losing, and the pass must lead to a touchdown that results in at least a tie, but preferably a win. That is a Hail Mary. <gasps> Most quarterbacks are likelier to marry a supermodel than to throw a successful Hail Mary in their career. Exhibit A, Tom Brady. So how did this play, which practically requires an act of God, come to pass? See what I did there? Easy, with a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. So it's December 28th, 1975. 50 yards from the end zone, but needing a touchdown to win, Cowboys quarterback and devout Catholic, Roger Staubach, whispers a Hail Mary to himself. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee and launches a desperation pass to receiver Drew Pearson. The Cowboys win and the Hail Mary is christened forevermore. Any questions? Good. Now go win me some ball games. <laughs> <laughs>